Well, our speaker tonight is Paul, Paul Cowdell. Cowdell or Cowdell? How do you pronounce it? Either. You don't I, mind. I, I, I say Cowdell, but... Cowdell. Okay, we'll go for Cowdell. Paul is a research fellow at the University of Hertfordshire. Uh, he's a member of the Folklore Society Council and the editorial boards of the journal Folklore and the Folk Music Journal. This is the first time ever that Dorset Humanists has had a talk on folklore and ghosts. Because none of us believe in ghosts, do we? Well, maybe we'll find out um, as we go through the evening. But please give Paul a very warm welcome. Thank you, David. Thank you, everyone, for the invitation, um, and thank you for coming, and uh, welcome. So, uh, before I get going, a couple of words of introduction and background. Talking about ghosts here may seem provocative, uh, it clearly, but it clearly touches on questions of interest to humanists, although perhaps not from an angle you'll all be familiar with. So what I'm going to do is talk about my research uh, and use that as a way of exploring some maybe different approaches to important questions for humanists. I once spoke at a Fortean ghost event and a critic said afterwards that most of the talks had been at the soft end of ghost investigation. Now I can make comments about the hard end of investigation but one thing I think it'll be helpful to probe here is how there really isn't any easy or satisfactory way of separating the two which is very much related to my disciplinary training and affiliation. And so at the risk of sounding a little bit al anon, my name is Paul and I'm a folklorist. <laughs> <laughs> Back in 1980, the Folklore Society held a conference on the folklore of ghosts. Um, the Society published the proceedings, which are now sadly out of print and pretty much unobtainable, but invaluable. And in her introduction to this, uh, former Folklore Society president, uh, Hilda Ellis Davidson, an eminent scholar of Anglo-Saxon and Norse folklore and religion, laid out the approach of folklorists to this question. We're not concerned with how far reported manifestations may be genuine, she wrote, but the papers here dealt with, quote, opinions voiced about ghosts, with tales told about them for entertainment as well as from conviction, and the means used to prevent their appearance, so that it wouldn't be possible to pronounce judgment on the cases involved. We may not accept that ghosts ha uh, have an objective existence, or that ghostly manifestations are caused by departed spirits, but we are bound to accept that stories and traditions about such things have long existed and obstinately continue to do so." End quote. Now that doesn't preclude using this material for other purposes, nor using other research material for this purpose, which may be one of the take-home points I want to make tonight. Um, but folklorists have adopted a broad sweep in the area and continue to echo that call for cooperative efforts. So I'd like to quote another folklorist on this. Um, introducing a folkloric monograph on ESP, Linda Daig noted that, quote, Parapsychologists ask whether the appearance, appearance is for real or not. Folklorists ask what is the nature of human creativity to be discerned through the report of such experience. The two quests differ. There may or may not be a bridge to connect the two, and it's a challenge to cross the boundaries. Uh, I quote Linda Daig in part because I've been critical of her elsewhere. Um, particularly on some of her other formulations on belief where she's been rather less generous of spirit. Uh, but I think she's absolutely right on that and I offer this talk in that spirit. Originally, uh, initially, the, society, the, the Dorset Humanists approached the Folklore Society about a speaker on folklore generally and folkloric beliefs, particularly as they touch on humanist concerns. This came my way because I'm an academically trained folklorist and my doctoral research was on contemporary belief in ghosts. I asked people about their beliefs in and experiences of ghosts and tried to put it into the context of their institutional religious and other beliefs and to understand their ghost narratives from a folklore perspective. This also involved looking at other disciplinary and theoretical approaches because it turns out pretty much everybody everywhere at every point has had something to say about ghosts. Some of the areas were predictable, history, psychology, parapsychology, 
some perhaps less so medical sociology criminology political philosophy and this was reflected in my field work I received 45 responses to a qualitative questionnaire I spoke to 110 people in person there was some overlap between those two uh, I also rather randomly received 78 email communications uh, with the psychologist Richard Wiseman following his Science of Ghosts blog. 227 people are reflected in my thesis um, and around 80 of its 230 pages are bibliography of around 1200 items. Now I'm not going to say ah, and still I only scratched the surface. <laughs> I, I did I did get further than that, but that's not exhaustive by any stretch of the imagination. So, on a not unrelated note, my apologies for having a written talk, but it's your best chance of me stopping at any point. It's fine, it's fine. Um, but I do, I would welcome when we get to the questions, you know, kind of pretty much a discursive approach. Do feel free to ask if there's anything about any of these aspects. I may not be able to answer, but. And I mention all of this because. I think a bigger overview is essential. In England specifically, we're not just talking scholarly background, we're talking extremely strong local tradition. England's ghostliness is all but cliche. Uh, one of the best social historians on this question, who's the current president of the Folklore Society, began this excellent book with the words, England has long had a reputation for being haunted. Uh, when the folklorists Jennifer Westwood and Jacqueline Simpson compiled their compendious gazetteer of, of English folklore on the left, they were able to extract a completely separate book on the right, just of the ghost stories. And this didn't exhaust any of the material that they'd collected. Um, there's barely a village in England without a ghost tradition. In the 1940s, one Warwickshire folklorist estimated uh, that there was one ghost per square mile on his local patch. <laughs> and it's got long historical standing. Joseph Addison in the 18th century wondered why we abound with more stories of this nature. Um, and at the beginning of the 20th century, Carl Jung expressed surprise at finding as much belief in ghosts in Switzerland as, in his words, among the English. <laughs> and again, there's a slight provocation in quoting Jung because he's such a problematic figure. But the overview isn't just about historical curios. When I first discussed this with Simon, um, one clear area of interest that arose was social utility of supernatural beliefs, their persistence in particular socio-historic socio contexts. I began my doctoral work shortly after the 2008 banking crash and one of the questions I regularly heard was whether such beliefs might become more prevalent at such periods of social and economic uncertainty. And since World War II, opinion polls have suggested that stated belief in ghosts has doubled in Britain. Uh, polls around a decade ago showed 30 to 35 percent of the British population stating a belief in ghosts. Uh, similar trends can be found elsewhere, actually with higher numbers. <coughs> but even as this was unfolding, alongside the consolidation of some broadly neo-pagan new religious movements, the historian Keith Thomas was bluntly describing witchcraft and ghosts in this as among the things, quote, now rightly disdained by intelligent persons, unquote. It's only partly flippancy on my part to note that publication of this comment in hardback and paperback in 1971 and 73 respectively coincided with the appearances at the same time in paperback and on film of William Peter Blatty's The Exorcist. Mm. Like Keith Thomas's book, Blatty's has also had an enormous influence, although in a rather different way and possibly among a different audience, possibly. Its enormous success in finding that audience, though, can at the very least be said to place a question mark over Keith Thomas's assertion. And parenthetically, I don't think it's the last time you'll find a brilliant and authoritative scholar making an assertion that's not based on the same standard of evidence and argument as the work they're recognised for. Just floating that. But it is worth flagging up a point about sceptical attitudes to ghost belief. Um, the contradiction between ghost belief and assertions that 
they are, they are or should be in decline may take a particularly curmudgeonly form now, but it, they're not new. Gosshold Lessing, writing in 1767, we no longer believe in ghosts? Who says that? Or rather, what does it mean? Those are still the questions. Because the polls are interesting, but the headline figures aren't straightforward. Uh, what might be new might be the social context in which belief can be admitted rather than the belief itself. It's noticeable, for example, that um, the reported levels of non-belief don't change very much at all across the same polling period. <coughs> There's an assumption, too, that the polls are all reporting the same thing, which I don't think stands up. The difficulty is what assumptions are coded into the questions in those polls and how the questions are interpreted by the respondents and people interpreting the polls afterwards. Non-belief might just be a clearer position to express. And looking to map ghost beliefs on or against more orthodox religious beliefs, I compared those figures with other polls of belief and church going. Oh, hang on. I had another one. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, and you start to find difficulties. A 2003 poll, for example, recorded 1% of American Christians apparently not believing in God, which seems a basic postulate, you'd have thought. Okay, perhaps it's a statistical artifact, that happens. But other polls suggest something more complex. In 2007, only 97% of self-identified born-again Christians in the US polled as believing in God. <laughs> uh, for US Catholics and Protestants in the same poll, the figures were respectively 92 and 95%. Uh, a rather different 2019 poll reported only 79% of self-identified Western European Christians professing belief in God. It's still under-investigated, but clearly complex. The steady small rise in reported ghost belief may reflect changing polling methods. It's been suggested that online polling can be more accurate in some respects because responses given in person tend to exaggerate socially desirable, conformist, less embarrassing positions and patterns of behaviour. But it may also suggest a different ways of discussing the subject. Whatever the subject is. Because you find pretty quickly that nobody much likes the word ghost, but everybody uses it with the assumption that they understand what everybody else means by it. And I doubt some of the statistical authority of the polls for that reason. Um, I wanted to know about my informants' experiences and their beliefs, but also how they understood, interpreted and explained the concepts. And ghost might just not be the best word to start with. This wonderful book, 1987, Gillian Bennett illustrates this brilliantly. She began her field work, she said blankly, going around asking, do you believe in ghosts? And everyone said no. And then she said, luckily, she was put right by a woman saying no, but she did know a house could be spirited. And another woman saying, no, she didn't believe in ghosts, but whenever someone's going to be ill in my family, my mother comes to me. But just because it summarises a whole range of historical meanings, images, expectations that may not match an informant's own thinking, I think it'd be equally mis a mistake to assume it's useless or entirely misleading as a word. Many people I spoke to used what they saw as commonly accepted wrong terms and ideas just in order to introduce and explain their own quite different thinking. Uh, Eve, the secretary of a spiritualist church, just really patiently explained to me her conceptions of the world of spirit or what you call ghosts, she said. <laughs> and she said she never uses the word, but it gave her a way of finding common ground with what she thought my conception of ghosts was. And he said he actively objects to the word, preferring spirit because we're all spirit. Now that one may be increasing um, because of its almost scientific, scientistic connotations. Uh, there's a regular school of thought that sees post-mortem survival as comparable with or resembling electricity or radio waves. Uh, Nigel Neal's The Stone Tape has certainly made it popular. And it may sound modern, but supernatural belief structures 
always take into account the latest scientific developments. In part, this is just confirmation of Arthur C. Clarke's uh, dictum that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Yeah. We all know how our mobiles work, but we couldn't most of us fix one. But it is also a warning not to read people just as wandering expressions of their institutional religious doctrines as they're written down. It's, it's a more complicated dialectical interaction. I gave a talk at a synagogue uh, discussion group and the rabbi introduced it with effectively the official position. He said, Judaism's not opposed to the search for ghosts. The Torah doesn't encourage it, but it does give instructions on how to go about it. Uh, <laughs> but the instructions on ghost inves investigation conclude by removing ghostly aspirations from institutional control. In the rabbi's words, if you want to see a ghost, you will. <laughs> Which paved the way for this brilliant, wide-ranging discussion. Um, you know, there were people claiming, suggesting electrical impulse, electrical stimuli as a trigger for certain phenomena. Well, actually, the most sceptical uh, participant was expressing doubt about even the rabbi's orthodox religious positions. And believers certainly do seize on new metaphors as they become available with new technologies. So Honduran Caribs have described mediumistic shamans as a telephone exchange between man and God. But this also emerges in attempted literal scientific applications, like uh, Cromwell Varley's attempts to merge spiritualism and telegraphy in practice, or Thomas Edison's work on developing a valve to enable communication with the dead, or at least to hear them better, although that may have been a joke at a journalist's expense. There's no neutral terms. So I wanted to find ways of opening discussions about pretty much any post-mortem contact and use that as a way of negotiating the informant's preferred te terminology. So I wasn't looking for material on other arcana UFOs, say, but I didn't rule out recording it if informants felt it was important to them to, to explain it. I mean, there are historical legends of ghost lights like these in Bengal. <laughs> Uh, they're most often now understood as escaping gases in, in wetland areas. And their gradual disappearance as stories says more about climate change and land use than it does about belief. But these stories have been taken over into UFO narratives. I mean, one informant who worked for a commercial space program connected the similarity of phenomena between ghost and UFO reports, but he did so because I was speaking to an ex-RAF uh, friend of his who was discussing ghosting in radars, uh, in radar images. One of, my one of the few informants who did discuss UFO experiences was a builder who worked them into a cosmology of his own, telling me the Bible, quote, makes so much more sense if you replace God with extraterrestrial. <laughs> In effect, you get a meeting point between two quite separate things. The experience of anomalous phenomena that are difficult to understand and a scientific, scientific interpretation offered for them on the one hand, and on the other, underlying beliefs, which some of which aren't explicitly articulated. Which is why the word ghost is so confusing, um, even to people who argued for post-mortem survival and contact. Ghost seems to imply visual apparitions of a very particular sort that just doesn't reflect people's actual experiences or conceptions. A, a, a lot of people were quite specific about the connotations that they disliked in the word. One questionnaire respondent actually began, Casper does spring to mind. If that suggests a certain cynical flippancy, which was borne out by the rest of his questionnaire, I must say, um, he still went on to explain that he believes in the, quote, possibility that life may not end with death of body, unquote, and that visually ghosts are the presence of some seen or felt phenomena which do not satisfy normal concepts of recognition. And he wrote of something that you can see through which should normally have some form. There's a groping for words to describe an anomalous experience which may be quite valid but still inexplicable in known terms. Hence the invocation of other beliefs that are quite separate from it. 
I mean, David Hufford's excellent work on uh, REM sleep paralysis and supernatural narratives could be read mm. uh, simply within the framework of scientific knowledge of sleep paralysis. But one of his readers wrote to him afterwards, uh, I'll quote this, it appears that you have discovered the neurophysiological mechanism by which these entities gain access to us, <laughs> unquote. So the room for evasion is complex. Experiences may be outside culture, but their interpretations aren't. Visual apparitions were reported by some of my informants, but they weren't necessarily typical or standard, even though that's how ghostliness is usually thought of or presented, which may also reflect a Western philosophical hierarchy of senses that prioritizes sight. Um, which may be why there have been so many psychical research articles lately questioning the decline in visual apparitions. Um, Anna emailed me to say that she'd seen a shadowy form when she was about five or six, a type of experience she'd had several times since, but the only idea of what I had of what a ghost probably looked like then was the white cartoony kind. Bernadette, uh, I had a long talk with Bernadette, who was great, began her discussion of the concept of ghost with an appeal to the white-sheeted figure most familiar now from children's TV. And Bernadette said she found this word a cliché because I think of ghosts and I think of someone with a giant bedsheet with the holes cut out swishing around on roller skates. <laughs> she also preferred the word spirits and was unusual in describing visual apparitions, although uh, these were more transparent than anything else. More typically, Bernadette's experiences included auditory and physical phenomena, as well as general feelings of presence. So by asking how respondents understood the word ghost before going on to discuss forms of contact between the living and the dead, I gave informants an opportunity to consider or include non-visual forms of manifestation. And these were contested. Karras recalled one witness of two interpreting a tassel moving as apparent, uh, apparently unaided as an indication of post-mortem contact from a loved one, but the other witness did disagreed. Kathleen reported a distinctive smell that had appeared in her house shortly after her mother's death. And she said, my mother didn't smell. Um, but this smell then recurred on notable family anniversaries. Ray referred to the smell of sweat in an empty room, followed later by the sensation of presence in his car, even though there was no one there. There were similar ranges in the visual reports. Uh, many aspects of a story that Lauren told me about feeling there was somebody in the back of the car uh, chimed with Ray's account just now. Lauren saw nobody in the car. But friends following close behind told her when they stopped for petrol that they'd seen a small boy sitting on the seat behind her. Lauren's account to me uh, encapsulates the range of experiences reported during this, uh, during this research and the complex negotiations between the informants. Lauren's friends saw the child, she didn't, but she was aware of something odd and felt a presence. That night she awoke in the small hours to see a small boy in a striped shirt standing by her desk. She said she thought this was an unconscious attempt to rationalise the earlier experience. But she later accompanied a friend to a medium who described seeing a small boy in a striped shirt standing close to her. Lauren was pretty sceptical about this medium's abilities, but did add the, add the detail to further complicate a narrative that she enjoyed telling as her party piece, her words. There was a range of pe who these apparitions were too, including people known to the recipients, uh, a dead school friend who approached Peter at a rave, and complete strangers. There was no consistency of appearance to these recognisable human figures. They just they were effectively indistinguishable from the living. The only quality that marked them as ghosts was inappropriate presence. There was nothing inherently ghostly in their manifestation, nor was anachronistic clothing necessarily noted. Although some informants did report figures in clothing they identified either at the time or quite often afterwards as roughly historically dateable. Um, a, a woman in Chatham saw a man she first thought was a tramp in a ragged leather coat 
Um, when she turned back, he'd gone mysteriously, uh, and she later started to associate him, this figure, with Napoleonic soldiers who'd been detained in a military prison very close to the site. The, the interaction with history is, is kind of a, is an interesting one. I, I can't go into it. If anybody wants a copy, I've got some off prints of a, an article I wrote a while back on that kind of relationship. I mean, Hugh, who worked in the library, uh, was probably unusual, I think. He said he'd become aware while he was working in a joiner's workshop of being observed by a small girl in a Victorian pinny. And he associated this with uh, a Jewish cemetery next door to the workshop. Uh, but the story he shared from his brother was the real outlier, though, because his brother reported having seen a knight in armour on a fully armoured horse riding around Kensal Rise Cemetery, which was opened in 1832. Ghost of Hamlet's father. Mm. <laughs> um, other manifestations were less substantial which is in effect that Victorian theatre worked very hard and su oh no, hello, oh, it's gone, um, worked very hard at that one, worked very hard and very successfully to reproduce with mirrors. Um, Bernadette's first ghost experience involved a woman who was part translucent. There was light coming through her and I could kind of see things behind her. Jenny told me about a whole range of experiences, um, including a sensation of terror not attached to a visual experience, the apparition of a shadowy but recognisable human figure, later identified as a family friend she hadn't known, and from older family tradition, a radiant glowing orb that appeared to her great-grandmother when her uncle died abroad. <coughs> a range of experiences was tolerated even for the same ghost. Maggie only once saw the ghost that haunted her house, which wasn't quite a solid and recognisable human form as described by others, although she did identify it with an apparition of that type that she'd seen reported from the churchyard over the road from the house. On the one occasion Maggie saw this ghost, her nephew had also just seen it. He initially thought it was Maggie, but described different clothes. Um, but Maggie's sighting came after it had passed through her, almost like being hit by water going straight through you. And she also identified this ghost with a presence which manifested in the house chiefly in poltergeist type activity. And that was why you got Harry Price, because the tedious self-publicist psychic researcher Harry Price, even he found the similarity of poltergeist phenomena down the centuries boring. Um, at my informant Hugh, who'd seen the, uh, the child in the Victorian pinny, he was much more entertaining, summarised his own thinking you see ghosts if they want you to see them. Poltergeists just muck you about. <laughs> now one, uh, one technique that folklorists use uh, is to look for recurring motifs and patterns of narrative and belief. And having identified them, it, it's possible to plot them onto narratives of personal experiences and accounts of historical events. Reviewing ghost narratives and collecting them it's striking how often similar themes recur, either as direct motifs or as their background backdrop. There's plenty of them. But let's talk about white sheets, because they're a good way to touch on how that works and what's contained within it. Let's take uh, a pretty well-known historical account. Uh, during December 1803, an apparition was plaguing Hammersmith. It usually wore a white sheet, uh, although it apparently sometimes appeared in an animal skin. A locksmith's wife was rumoured to have died of fright. Two people were said to be dangerously ill from shock after confronting it. And it was reported to be the ghost of a local man who'd committed suicide a year before. It's great as a story because of the traditional motifs. It tells us who's likely to become a ghost. Um, the motif of violent or untimely death, or both in this case. Uh, ideas about ghosts are often tied up with a sense of something left undone or unresolved. Un untimely death always has uh, a particular emotional weight, but any form of death leaves some disorientation. So unresolved tasks may be tiny and prosaic. Maggie said her grandmother had complained through a medium about not being laid out in the nightgown that was bought specifically for that purpose. 
at whatever experiential level, ghosts tend to be, by definition, things which are somewhere or somewhen they shouldn't be. Um, it's an experience that's then interpreted according to underlying beliefs and belief systems. One informant, an academic known to me, said, I don't believe, I keep an open mind. I said, well, okay, well, what would make you believe? She said, seeing one. I said, does that not mean that you do already believe? Yeah, she said. <laughs> I met paranormal investigators who conducted vigils with the aim of documenting visual apparitions which could be used as evidence to corroborate their belief argument to other people. Uh, and before we run off with any ideas of excess of credulity, everyone I talked to watched Most Haunted, and nobody I talked to thought it was legit. Uh, in fact, one paranormal investigator described her team as sceptical because unlike Most Haunted, they were open to null findings. Uh, she said Most Haunted's success rate was absolutely silly and unachievable, but spoke of her ambition of finding someone to come through to give us proof that there's life after life, which she contrasted with this unconvincing evidence. I mean, plenty of my informants were at pains to stress the experiences they thought weren't supernatural because these emphasised both their critical faculties and thus strengthened their argument for the ones they thought were. Go back to Hammersmith. For Hammersmith's story, it's got a lot about how rumours and legends spread. Um, but overall, it turns out to hinge on people telling ghost stories to scare each other. Folklorists distinguish between different types of story. Folk tales, broadly, are the ones told for entertainment. Um, or fiction. Legends are the ones told as or about fact. So folk tales are once upon a time and it wasn't your time and it was a, it was, but it was a very good time. While legends are, you know that tree at the top of the road? Um, again, over broadly, tales tend to be multi-episodic, legends tend to be just one episode. Um, but there's huge crossover, so we can find the same episode being told in one place as a true story of place and in another place as part of a longer story that's not about a real place. Hammersmith also tells us a lot about what people expect ghosts to look like. Um, the white sheeted figure, however often parodied, remains traditional as a visual image. When spirit photography first produced such white draped figures, Alfred Russell Wallace argued that uh, the conventional white-sheeted ghost was not then all fancy, but had a foundation in fact, which was uh, unfortunately an extremely circular argument. But back to Hammersmith. Late December 1803, the ghost story is already circulating, and a local bricklayer called Thomas Millwood, who worked in white apron, white linen trousers and a white waistcoat, unfortunately, <laughs> startled two gentlemen and, uh, a gentleman and two ladies in a coach, the man shouted, there goes the ghost. Millwood was extremely annoyed, saying that he was no such thing. He swore at the man and threatened to punch him in the head. <laughs> I like Thomas Millwood a lot. Um, he then turned down his own mother's advice that he should wear a great coat over his whites. I like him even the more for it. But this was a mistake, because by now there were gangs out every night hunting the ghost. Uh, on January the 3rd, 1804, Francis Smith uh, was drinking in the White Hart with a local watchman, William Girdler. They fixed passwords so they didn't shoot each other, and then they separated to look for the ghost. Francis Smith challenged a ghostly figure. Uh, when it didn't respond, he shot it, killing Thomas Millwood. He turned himself in as soon as he realised what he'd done. The real, real ghost did turn out to be a hoaxer. Shoemaker James Graham told a magistrate he had previously dressed up as a ghost to scare his apprentices, but he did so because the apprentices had been frightening his children with ghost stories. So this doesn't come out of nowhere, even if the transparency of the apparition might have done. We can't just dismiss pranks because they're pranks. Uh, in 2009, reports of an apparition of a white lady attracted hundreds of visitors to Coal Island in Northern Ireland. Local teenagers were having a field day draping sheets over mannequins and poking them out of hedges. Uh, but they said, rather disappointed to the press, you know, 
they weren't going to fool anybody because everybody's been trying it. We've been dressing up in sheets and stuff, but it's not working at all. But the light-hearted informal account and parody of haunting just worked to reinforce traditional beliefs, not discredit them. No one may have been taken in by the kids in the sheets, but they underscored the site's previous history of phantom hitchhikers. Um, and as narratives proliferated, they expanded. There were suggestions of an earlier apparition, reports of a recently cut down fairy tree that, I, mean, I think this one's gilding the lily, even as a folklorist. Uh, this fairy tree had been planted over a spirit bottle. Local press uh, reported a resident explaining that the priest would exorcise the place, put the spirit in the bottle, then a tree would be planted over it so it would never be disturbed. All of these motifs are common enough, but the merger of them all together is new. But despite the novelty, it points to the way repeated narrations will gradually streamline a story in line with traditional bodies of narrative. Recognisable elements will be incorporated and existing elements will become more familiar. Which can include the incorporation of legends that might elsewhere appear almost as jokes. Uh, in Oxfordshire, a local man who was thought to be daft was challenged in the pub one night that he wouldn't go to the local bone house at midnight and bring back a skull. Now this was quite specific, site specific, about Shipton under Witchwood uh, and, and its charnel house. So he accepts. Two men go ahead of him and hide in the bone house. At midnight, he enters. He picks up a skull and a voice from nowhere says, put that down, that's mine. So he puts it down, picks up another one. And the voice says, put that down, that's mine. And he says, what? You got two heads, then I'll have one of them. <laughs> and he wins the bet. It's a funny story. It's widely recorded, nationally, internationally. Um, it's, it's got a recognised narrative motif in the standard motif index of folk literature, uh, H1435, collecting skulls from a child house as a test of fear. That's how often it turns up. But stripped of local detail, it's also found as a constituent episode in the folk tale, The Boy Who Wanted to Know What Fear Was. Stories don't tell themselves. Folklore 101. Narratives are used by narrators to illustrate an underlying story they want to express. And contestation of component parts of that story, including by parody and by prank, serve to reinforce underlying beliefs, even by discounting some of them. There seems to be this common assumption that comic invocation of ghosts points to declining seriousness about the subject, and that using white-sheeted figures for comic purposes uh, prevents those serious about ghosts from using it at all. But all of my informants who shared stories and thoughts were capable of humour. They were, many of them, extremely funny. Uh, many jokes that you'll have heard before. Uh, you know, uh, wrong meeting information being published in psychic news adverts and a guy at a spiritualist church saying, well, you'd thought they'd have had some foresight of this. Mm. Uh, a Swedish scholar of Gnosticism recalled a, a children's TV program in Sweden in the 70s in which a white-sheeted ghost had picked up the hem of his uh, sheet to blow his nose, thus revealing his testicles, which my informant said was a bit strong even for Swedish ch children's TV at the time. <laughs> one, of my, one of my most entertaining informants was a former hotel security guard, um, e Jerry. Each of his stories ended with the potentially ghostly experience being completely undermined or disbelieved, usually for comic effect. But the cumulative impact of his narrations wasn't to discredit belief. Rather, each story depended for its humor humorous deflation on the possibility there could have been an underlying truth to it. Uh, he had this great story. In a hotel in the northwest, um, he would show around the new guards. There was a ballroom uh, uh, named after one of the guests uh, who died there, a woman called Mabel, and it had a, a ceiling fan light, um, uh, which was remote operated. So he'd take the new security guard into this room in the dark and say, and tell him the story and say, well, let's see if we can call her. Mabel! Mabel! Give us a sign! And then he'd work the remote in his pocket and the lights would start to flicker. <laughs> uh, 
but it wasn't simply playing with the affect of ghostliness. It rested on an underlying sense of the likelihood of activity. I mean, he was serious about, you know, when he'd found dead bodies in hotels, said he always thought that were he ever to have a ghostly experience, it would be in that kind of place. Um, and said that actually that hotel often had an extremely unpleasant uh, feeling about it. In one hotel, it was a sackable offence to use the gas-operated clothes dryers uh, overnight because they were dangerous. And one of his colleagues kept doing it. So he persuaded a third guard to dress up in a white sheet and hide inside the dryer and then jump out to try and scare him out of doing this. And it failed miserably because the guy just looked at him and went, you look bloody silly in that, Gary. <laughs> Which is also actually a punchline with centuries of, um, of, of history to it. The intention was clearly to scare the guard by invoking the image, however funny it was. Uh, another of his stories contextualises the pale figures. He said he was startled one night in a staff corridor in a hotel, meeting this ghostly, uh, this pale-faced old woman with long grey hair and a gown. And he was absolutely terrified until he realised she was a resident with Alzheimer's who'd got lost inside the hotel. Um, again, he gave it a very funny performance but it rested on the familiarity of the image and the possibility of misidentifying the living and dead. And he said, oh, there's always a grey lady about hotels. It's open to interpretation, that, but it does chime with a remark that I heard about ghosts in hospitals. The former nurse mentioning a grey lady from many hospital traditions who said, and there is a grey lady. Now, Notwithstanding the humour, it's still based on expectations of belief, which is complicated because that may not sit comfortably with other beliefs. Ghost belief has always sat awkwardly with institutional Christian practice for the most part. You get medieval ghost accounts in sermons intended to explain hell to lay people in terms they can understand. Come the Reformation, ghost belief gets touted as a Catholic superstition. Uh, with the added corruption that purgatory is just used to fleece uh, congregants into paying for more masses. The trouble is, a century after the... Is oh, hello. There was a... Oh, yes, a grey lady. Um, a century after the establishment of the Church of England, which takes a very dim view of ghosts, people still haven't stopped reporting seeing them. Abolishing pur purgatory was supposed to stop all that, but it didn't. Anglicans were alarmed that this persistence of doctrinally unorthodox stuff tried to fob it off as over-credulous dissenters. But they were also worried that if you abandoned superstitions, you might also end up abandoning the church. So they had to tread a very fine line. By the way, this is me as a, this is a kind of folklorist parenthesis here. I try as far as possible not to use the word superstition, which is always pejorative for academics and non-academics alike. Uh, we have religion, they have superstitions. Um, you know, we have beliefs, they have superstitions. And I only realized this, I, uh, I'd been talking to my dad about, I'd been researching turning silver over in your pocket when you see a new moon. And he said, oh, you should have asked your granddad about that. He used to do that. And I said, oh, my, my granddad had been dead 20 years at this point. I said, why did you never tell me this before? And he said, well, it's just superstition. And my dad was, an extremely active um, and serious churchgoer uh, participant in his church right up to his death. You know, it just didn't square with his other beliefs. So you skip forward a century after this kind of uh, blaming the, the Methodists. You've got developing understanding of evolutionary theory, rapid development of scientific techniques. Ghost reports still haven't gone away but they're now incorporating all of these new scientific developments as well. I mean, given his reputation as Darwin's bulldog, it's quite funny to find Thomas, ha Thomas Huxley choosing not to expose an evidently fraudulent medium, partly out of gallantry, he thought she was charming, um, <laughs> but partly, I think, a philosophical limitation. Uh, and, you know, we can maybe talk about that in the questions too, because I think that one hasn't gone away. Uh, thinking of, say, Richard Dawkins' meme theories. But religious institutions still have to cope with all of this stuff. Uh, the, there's lots of stories, and some of them quite funny, about Catholic irritation at the upsurge of demands for exorcism uh, after the, the film The Exorcist came out. 
the Church of England has always had exorcism available as a last resort, but didn't like to publicize this, uh, but started to kind of formalize it more regularly in response to the same demand. But one Anglican exorcist told me that his first question when he summoned was always to look at whether there were questions of mental illness. You know, again, the science um, is involved. And this has an impact on the, the people who are actually going to churches. They're formally adherents of that church, but beware any reductionist assumption that this means some uncomplicated identification with the doctrines and tenets of that church as written down. It doesn't stop them seeing ghosts they don't recognize doctrinally. Uh, I mean, it, considering that earlier question about belief in relation to economic conditions, it might be worth thinking of institutional religious e expression and structures, churches and so on, as being much more responsive to those immediate social pressures um, than the underlying uh, informal and folk beliefs which are much slower moving and uh, much harder to kind of eradicate in, in that way or sort of to get through. Uh, I mean, <laughs> J.S. Oodle reported an 18... Uh, folklorist, an 1883 comment from Dorset that I never knows what they be because if they were spirits gone to heaven, they wouldn't want to come back and if they was gone to the other place, they wouldn't be let come back. <laughs> Which is doctrinally unimpeachable without actually mm. gainsaying the experiences. Well, in 1990, uh, there was a report uh, somebody wrote to Vivian Ray Ellis, this couple of an apparition, they uh, wrote about an apparition, began their letter we are practicing Anglicans and do not believe in ghosts. That potential conflict is containable and negotiable at a private level and maybe, ne maybe needs to be kept at that level precisely because it could cause conflict if elevated to an institutional level. Uh, one woman told me that her grandmother uh, had played the organ in her local Anglican church until she fell out with the vicar because she'd said to him, a ghost keeps, in, keeps moving my music in the, in the organ loft. He was not happy with this. So it's, it's not surprising if we find a willingness to engage with complexities and differences of opinion that's not confined to people with some form of congregational expression, however informal. Um, I'm going to try and just skip on a little bit because I know that we're a little bit pressed. But um, I mean... It, that negotiation of complexity was common to an engagement with experiences and beliefs thought to lie outside the mainstream. But what emerged in fieldwork, and is sometimes overlooked, I think, by academics, was the widespread dynamism of thought and flexibility of discussion that exists around heterodox beliefs, which has a knock-on effect when it comes to actually sharing these stories. This was most noticeable in the accommodation of various levels of belief and non-belief through their grouping around convenient terms, however inexact. But it didn't mean that informants were just ready and willing to discuss heterodox beliefs and informants with anybody. But the seriousness of the topic and the seriousness with which they took it meant that people are not prepared just not to talk about it either. They're just trying to find an appropriate audience and an appropriate way of discussing with an inappropriate audience. Uh, I mean, given what I've said about England's hauntedness and reported rise in ghost belief since the war, it's worth noting a similar claim about declining ghost narratives and belief being made in 1954 by... Um, I'm going to skip through that one. Uh, by another controversial figure, Margaret Murray, uh, when she was president of the Folklore Society, uh, in, in a presidential address on England as a field for folklore research, when she said ghost stories are dying out, so you have to go and record them. But it's also worth noting that one audience member recorded an audible sigh of respectful disagreement with this in the room, which became more explicit afterwards when it was reported in the press. An anonymous, an anonymous correspondent sent the author Alastair Alpin McGregor a press cutting about the lecture with the, and that comment defaced with the words, utter rot, <laughs> with two exclamation marks. So how's all this managed? Bernadette said she wouldn't just have randomly mentioned ghosts to me, but because I'd raised the matter, she was prepared to trust my interests as a researcher. Many people, she said, just think we're making things up. That we referred to her family members, but it could equally be read as applying to anybody with such a body of experience and belief. 
She therefore based her decisions to speak on an assessment of the interest and serious likely responses of interlocutors. But she didn't necessarily expect to find shared identical thinking. It, it's extremely fluid. Um, I mean, Julia, who's an expert in and practitioner of contemporary witchcraft, asked me bluntly whether researchers had got away from treating psychics as fraudulent or deluded. Um, I tended not to mention Richard Wiseman's association even at arm's length with my research in, under those conditions. But even so, she still made it clear that that kind of hostility wouldn't have prevented her from discussing with such researchers. One young woman told me about her aunt, who'd had a ghost experience, and this aunt had met so much scepticism and disbelief from family members that she would ban them from talking while she told her story. But she always told her story. Which raises the question of how you talk to people about this. I was worried before I started that people would, wouldn't talk to me or would make their agreement to talk contingent on agreeing with my, my, my agreeing with their beliefs. As it turned out, the only people who wanted to know whether I believed or not in advance, before they talked to me at all, were the people who didn't believe. Because one guy actually said explicitly, I do not want you to be using this to justify belief in ghosts. Um, but it's such a contested and complicated area that people have already built into their ways of discussion an expectation that not everyone will agree with them and that some listeners will actively disagree with them. Which raises, and I'm moving towards the end here, with the, the kind of the big philosophical problem. The American pragmatist philosopher, also psychologist and parapsychologist, William James, deep in thought, talking about a medium made the famous argument, if you wish to upset the law that all crows are black, it is enough if you prove that one crow is white. Of course, this is predicated on holding out because you already believe not all crows are black. And regrettably, I have encountered this several times from skeptics and non-believers in, in an inverted form, the idea that all that's required to demonstrate the falsity of the belief is a demonstration of a single instance of fraud, which simply doesn't take into account the very negotiations that believers make every time they tell their stories, which always include those accounts of fraud. The famous medium, sorry, just thinking of, of William James, Eusepia Palladino, was caught in a fraud. And she said, well, that's your fault because you let me. The rest of the time it's been fine. <laughs> there aren't, I think, shortcuts to changing these folkloric patterns of belief which is why I'd urge anyone researching this area to think about how people narrate their stories. I have a great deal of sympathy with experimental research, but there's a tendency in it to underestimate the extent to which empirical factors are already and constantly built into narratives, whether as corroboration or as the disproof of the specific which confirms the general. Informants treat their experiences as extraordinary. We need to be sensitive to the negotiations they build into their accounts, as they too are indications of the belief systems that underlie them. There are certain patterns of narrative that can tell us as much about belief systems as the experiences they describe. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Lots of food for thought there. So, um, I wonder if we have any questions or ghost stories. Oh, yeah. Aaron, is, first of all, Aaron. <laughs> what do ghosts need with clothes? What, what do ghosts? What need with clothes? Well, that's. So, they, 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 if we go down this lane of their experience and they go in there, they take their clothes with them? <laughs> Well, and how does the ghost who's died take his horse with him? How does he communicate with the horse yeah. to say, well, I'm going to be dead in a minute, but I'm actually going to be dead. Come with me. What? How does that work? Well, Ambrose Bierce, um, talking about the question of, uh, of clothes, wondered why the clothes themselves don't just appear independent of the figure. Um, you get lots of kind of post hoc rationalizations for why ghosts appear in certain things. Um, so you'll get, oh yeah, white sheets because of 
shroud, burial. Uh, I mean, that, that woodcut uh, is way back here somewhere. Uh, that one. You know, you say, oh yes, well, this is clearly a shrouded figure, and this is a burial shroud, and you can invoke the Burial in Woolens Act of 1622. I don't hold me to that. Um, what you see is actually changing rationalizations for why ghosts appear. I, I, my argument for the, the White Shroud is that it's more about trying to find a way of expressing what the visual representation of something odd as a visual experience is. Um, so you don't get, for example, in Britain, you don't get reports of Roman ghosts until very recently, 1903, Owen Davis, I think, said was the first one he'd found. Um, and his argument is, well, that's because you need to know what a Roman centurion looks like before you can... Mm -hmm. What you get, though, are previous traditions of ghostly monks who are reported... You think, that's, the way the descriptions work, that's probably you simply laid another layer onto the narrative and it's become something... Like the ghost lights becoming UFOs. These monks have now become Roman centurions. Um, and you do still see the sort of crossovers. It was the Royal Derby Hotel, uh, Hotel Hospital, Royal Derby Ho Hospital. Um, there was a figure described in what, if you'd read it, I mean, it, this, this made the front page of the sun. Make of that what you will. But um, if you'd read it without any kind of explanation, it sounded like a monkish outfit. It sounded like a habit, um, except it was Oh no! This is a this is a Roman centurion. You think? Well, oh, I, I don't see that at all. Um, but I think it's because what's become the kind of more uh, accepted narratives. You do then get. I mean, as I say, with like the the woman in Chatham with the, the long coat. I think there are these kind of then there's retroactive attempts to fit historical clothing to an unexplained apparition. A, a policeman, he was um, in a work flat in, in Hertfordshire and he was lying in bed and he saw the shadow of a man with a long head, his description. And his first, his first feeling was, this is really embarrassing because I, this work flat for the police has been broken into and I'm about to become the victim of crime. Um, and then the figure disappeared. A week later, he's talking to the shopkeeper downstairs who tells him that one of the Saturday girls has quit because she'd met the figure of a man in an early 19th century long coat and tall hat uh, in the stockroom. And so he then associated it with that. Um, Francis Gross in the late 18th century talks about how you don't get English ghosts rattling chains. And this is because of um, English liberty, uh, unlike these kind of continentals who chain, it, chain their prisoners up. Um, so all sorts of things get used and get thrown into that mix. I mean, the, the Romans, uh, it's in Lincoln, um, Boots in Lincoln has part of the Roman wall in its cellar, and by appointment you can go down and see it. One of the one of the um, one of the security staff there, if he knew that there was going to be uh, people going down to see it, would dress up as a Roman legionary and walk around in the background, just not saying anything. Just <laughs> um, so those those kind of jokes play into it as well. Uh, short answer is. It doesn't make sense, but that's because those experiences didn't necessarily make sense. And so, uh, I mean, as I say, the fully armoured horse in Kensal Rice Cemetery was an outlier, even from the things that I heard. And I didn't hear it direct from the person who claimed to have experienced it. So, so now you know. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes, Mike. Uh, you haven't said if you yourself sort of experience anything that you weren't sure about and made some sort of narrative about it, have you? When I, you know I was saying I kind of, uh, I wasn't sure how to approach this. Um, 
I, I thought oh, I, I could be flippant, you know. I, there, there is a tradition in English folklore that firstborn children don't see ghosts. Um, so I could always say, you know, well, I'm a firstborn and therefore, but no, um, I, <laughs> I've had, my, my parents both died um, four years ago and it was extremely stressful organizing the funerals uh, within kind of close proximity. And we weren't sure about one of the arrangements that needed to be made. And I had a stress dream of my dad coming to me and saying, Anthony will sort this out. And I woke up and I was, there were two folklorists that I wanted to talk to about this because they would understand my distance from believing it as a ghost appearance, but also recognize the way it could be fitted into the, um, those things. N no, I don't. And it may be the case that people who don't have those underlying beliefs don't then report the anomalous experiences. So the sleep paralysis, uh, one of the very few of my informants who I think was um, philosophically absolutely consistent, materialist, atheist, um, for strong political reasons, uh, and extremely proud of having broken from his Scottish Catholic family background of belief. Uh, we were talking about this when I first started my research and he was uh, was clearly uneasy with the whole thing and I, I was explaining about the sleep paralysis stories and he said is that is that a thing then? And I said yeah. He said because he said when I was a teenager so this is just after he's broken from from all of this family religious background he said I had this experience I was asleep and then I was awake but I couldn't move and there was a figure on my chest choking me. It's good. Yeah, it's a classic sleep paralysis story. He said it was a Catholic priest. <laughs> I thought, it's wonderful. <laughs> but he'd never told anybody this because he didn't have a framework yeah, in which yeah. to tell it. Because it didn't fit with anything, you know, what he rationally understood as how it worked. Um, I'm relatively comfortable with my dreams and with my sort of unconscious and imaginative life. So quite happy to accommodate things that aren't questions of belief for me. Um, so do you feel that there's some of the people that you talk to might have similar experiences to you but they, they felt the need to make a narrative and need to make a story out of it which you don't? Possibly, although, although possibly I, I do narrate them but in different ways. Um, when I talked about the, the, the tassel turning, um, it's, it, it was an interesting story because it was um, the, the informant's father, uh, her mother had died and they had made a pact that whichever of them died first would appear to the other, would make some kind of intervention to the other. Now that's a very long-standing tradition. I mean, it, it turns up in those medieval sermons. Um, one comes back to say, oh my God, you, you, know, you really have got to sort your life out because I'm in hell and this is terrible. And that's generally how it kind of recurs. It's regularly reported, but not widespread. That particular instance did make me wonder if those kind of pacts are made, but they're not reported if there's nothing happens. Um, you know, so, so you may be looking at, and, and that's what I mean about this kind of submerged level of belief, is you may be looking at patterns where absence simply means nothing gets discussed. Um, and even the smallest presence may be discussed in a contested way um, and with differences between the people involved. I mean, it was interesting actually with the, that the tassel turning being interpreted as the informant's mother coming back because 
the person who thought it was was the father's new partner but the father didn't think it was perhaps because you know maybe I wonder how common those sleep paralysis experiences are because I remember before I'd even heard of the term sleep paralysis it was a previous speaker we had from Goldsmiths. Um, oh, Chris French. Yes, yeah, so Chris <laughs> French came to speak to us a number of years ago. And um, prior to him, him talking about that, I'd experienced what I'd sort of thought were poltergeists in the middle of the night, you know, the bed shaking or, you know, mm. my perception in the middle of the night was my bed shaking and thinking, oh, what's that all about? Mm. But when I heard about sleep paralysis, I thought, ah, oh, that, that's what's going on because there's that feeling that you can't move in bed. I wonder how many people have actually experienced that kind of moment of waking up in the middle of the night. Hands up those of you who've had a sort of sleep, what you might call sleep. Uh, not, you know, maybe three, but, three, not many. But yeah. I can't be by a ghost. No. Yeah. But, yeah. but actually, I mean, going back to, to Mike's question, <coughs> the one I had, it was there, I was, you know, I was kind of awake, could, awake enough, couldn't move, couldn't move. And a figure in a <laughs> trench coat and a hat, entered the bedroom, walked round the bed, came all the way up to me and started choking me. And I was delighted with this story. I didn't think it was, you know, any kind of supernatural intervention, but I was just delighted with the story, particularly as I then woke up and found one of my partner's hairs wrapped round my throat. Just one. Um, but yeah, so I, I mean... Chris French, I, I got knocked over by a bus a week after having dinner with Chris French. <laughs> um, I don't hold him responsible. <laughs> Very responsible. <laughs> but, yeah. I, it's, it's quite, it's quite, no, it, what I suppose what I'm saying is that, you know, if you've had an, an anomalous experience, it's quite nice then to hear that there is a kind of rational framework that you can understand it, you know, so. Yes, yeah. Mm. yeah. But you're suggesting there are lots of irrational frameworks around mm. which people will then fit things in as confirmation. Possibly, or, or possibly, it may be that the two things are actually kept quite separate um, until one needs to be explained. Uh, I mean, and that, that needs some sort of careful work through with people who, who are explaining. I mean, I heard one of, one of my informants who told me about um, sleep paralysis also told, uh, experience also told me about having a, an out-of-body experience, or attempting to have an out-of-body experience in sleep. So, but getting so excited about having this, oh my God, I'm having an out-of-body experience that he woke up. He was, oh. he was really disappointed and he said it never happened again. Um, so, I, I, I mean, I think there are different registers <laughs> at which you can respond to these kind of phenomena. Uh, right, okay, John and then, and then Roger, yeah, John. On a slightly prosaic note, how, how did you select your hundred of people you went to? Um, That's interesting talks. It was, I um, advertised around, uh, within the university, I didn't want to be just kind of bound to the university, ask people to, to circulate this. So that tends to kind of produce a self-selecting um, internal discussion group. I looked to uh, Hearts has a, a, a multi-faith ecumenical uh, chaplaincy, so I approached them. That was how I got the synagogue discussion group. The local Catholic priest rejected point blank uh, any discussion, saying this would not interest his parishioners. Which surprised me because the number of his parishioners did reply separately. Um, <laughs> I snowballed uh, that out. Obviously, I, I kind of made generally known what I was doing. Uh, I would talk to anybody, anywhere. Um, two days of tube strikes in London were extremely fruitful because I while I was waiting for buses or jammed onto buses, um, had a number of discussions 
that were you know really helpful so including the, the, the builder Phil who um, had met his dead friend at a rave and kind of merged his UFO experiences into this cosmology I met them standing in a bar in um, the, in the John Betjeman upstairs at King's Cross uh, while they were waiting for a train and I was waiting for a bus uh, and his mate actually was just silent throughout and I said you 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 know you're not saying anything you don't believe this he said I've just heard it so many times <laughs> from him um, you know and then the following night I was kind of like just wedged like this on a bus a long journey to East London and it's this thing you know the kind of it's a bit embarrassing and the guy wedged next to me gets chatting um, so what you do there <laughs> um, and but then he started telling me about a jinn possession that he witnessed back home in Pakistan um, and about falling down the stairs as a kid and feeling hands making sure that he didn't fall to the bottom so um, the questionnaire were kind of circulated I, I felt less happy with the circulation of the questionnaires um, yeah standing in bars talking to people randomly or what folklorists call field work <laughs> is I would, yeah I would just talk to anybody and I would uh, and people actually would talk to me if they saw me reading books on ghosts because I did everywhere they'd come and start you'd be surprised how many people will come and talk to you does, does it also help when you're wearing your white sheet does that, does that <laughs> attract people <laughs> then you jump out of <laughs> sorry um, uh, very, I was very flippant then um, Roger do you come from the planet in ghosts, believe in the, the narrative, the folklore, if you will, of the particular ghosts in that location of stories, ghosts outside the same time? Um, I've met, not in, that, not in that form, I think. I've, I've met kind of serious local folklorists who will document changing narratives of, of a particular site, but without expressing any kind of investment in it or, or, or not not appearing to have any skin in that game um, Jacqueline Simpson said to me fairly early on when I was discussing um, by email and she said you she said uh, she feels that as a folklorist if you're investigating you have de facto to have to adopt a position of disbelief um, and she's I mean she's a practicing um, quite high Christian uh, and she said because if I believed these were ghostly I would be drawn into feeling that I had to do something about them as demonic um, so that so I think for some serious folklorists there may be a kind of default position forced on them um, by the ne by the need to document it uh, but I didn't find that kind of uh, not not expressed in that form no Lynn yeah. um, you mentioned a few stories of sort of uh, one or two people seeing the same ghost but mm. at different times yes are there any stories of a group of four or five people all together in the room or something and all experiencing mm some sort of ghostly apparition at the same time because it seems to me that they're all really things in the brain that are, are triggered off so I did um, I, I did a vigil with the, the paranormal investigation team that I, I w was talking about uh, in a theatre and we went kind of in, in teams around various locations in the theatre and I mean, there were a couple of things that were kind of really interesting there, but up in the up in the balcony, a lot of the discussion hinged around um, orbs. Uh, for anyone who's ever sort of come across this, orbs are the most tedious. I mean, honestly, mind-numbing um, descriptions of visual phenomena on photographs. Hmm dust particles oh, as yeah. we like to call them yeah. um, <laughs> but we 
we were up in the balcony and there was like one guy was taking photographs and there was this long discussion everybody could see the phenomenon um, and he was saying oh no I, these are not orbs the orbs that I have seen they're the ones moving up not not falling like dust um, so even though everyone could see it I think there was still even within that believing group contestation of and actually one of the other sites on the to go on stage um, where they'd set up a Ouija board uh, and the, the paranormal investigator said to me beforehand you know we're gonna one of the sites will be a Ouija board it's up to you um, you know if you if you're not comfortable with it you don't have to do it um, I said no that's fine you know I will do the participant observation thing she said have you have you used a Ouija board before and I said yes uh, which was true and I was thinking I really hope and it goes back to the third thing I really hope I don't get the follow-up question of when um, because it was with a surrealist group uh, but it was what was really interesting was that ours was to, ours was the only team that got anything out of the Ouija board uh, and I um, they they prided themselves on not doing site research before their investigations because this made it objective because they um, one of the names that came out of, of the Ouija board session that I did was not accurately spelt but was very close to the name of one of the producers who had revived this particular theater in the 1960s none of them knew that um, and I was kind of, you know, reluctant to be triggering um, in that sense. I, I didn't have to actually, as it turned out, that the, the the minder from the theatre said, "Oh, well, that could be." Um, but I just, I did find that really interesting. That there's me. I don't believe um, we're the only ones who get any results. I'm the only one who actually recognises what this could have been interpreted as uh, and nobody else does so yeah I mean, that also goes back to that that point about they all want to find something which is incontrovertible as proof of the when that could be everybody agreeing on the same thing but not that I'm aware of Aaron yep. Are ghosts dying out? <laughs> in this 21st century internet, you can research anything, and people are just more scientifically aware of all sorts of things, orbs and lights and stuff. No, no, I think that what's happening is, as, as I say, I, I think you get a sort of a transfer, a continuum of phenomena being described and uh, interpreted in different ways so I think if you're talking about the white sheeted ghost yes but then the white sheeted ghost was never kind of standard typical anyway um, if you're talking about new technological things somebody said you know we didn't if if we switch our phones off how will they contact us because there is a thing of people burying mobiles with um, with their loved ones so, um, you know, so they can get a call from that number. <laughs> With a power source. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I mean it, it does also, yeah. <laughs> you, you have to bury the old Charging Nokia. Charging in the stuff. coffin, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, <clears throat> but then that's also, I mean, I haven't seen, the, I have seen the kind of a recognition that the power source will decline. Um, it, it's not quite a sort of mid 19th century Poe like um, we need to put a, a mobile in there in case we've prematurely buried them alive mm, um, it's not yeah. that and there is an acceptance that they are gone which actually may also echo earlier um, positions that basically you don't mourn too long because then you don't allow the dead mm. to, to pass away in peace <laughs> so a year and a day oh actually another one that I didn't interpret as 
supernatural but did really enjoy um, in the folk song tradition uh, there's a song The Unquiet Grave and you mourn for a year and a day but no more because if you do any longer then the dead can't rest um, my parents best friend died and I rang my mom and said I just kind of rang her anyway and how you been she said oh well, today's the anniversary the first anniversary of the death uh, oh I'm sorry yeah you know so we've just been quiet there the following night so a year and a day I go to my regular folk club and a very dear friend of mine sings the unquiet grave we'd had no discussion of this I was just like I was a bawling my eyes out not for any supernatural reason, just because you know lost his friend um, and I just thought it was really sweet but of course you could interpret that as some kind of, particularly as a fortnight later again without any discussion somebody came and gave me a recording of her singing it that night um, it was just because he happened to have done a recording of everybody that night and thought I should have one um, uh, no I think you I think you're just getting a sort of shift in what's being interpreted as ghostly um, what what's being expected because expectation and ghosts don't always sit together. I think people don't expect ghosts and that's the whole point is they're anomalous experiences but so, everybody's carrying a mobile phone around with them and can capture everything better than our eyes can see with night vision and stuff and there's CCTV mm. everywhere in every abandoned hotel and every, uh, everywhere there's, there's, uh, and there's not one BBC bulletin here's my first live capture of a ghost walking down to Park Square it's not happened it's, it's, mm. yeah, I don't think it's going to happen I, I think as we move forward every 12 year old has got a mobile phone as they grow up now I don't think ghosts are going to be part yeah. of well, it Actually, I mean, Richard Wiseman's Science of Ghosts blog, a lot of it was about photographs. You know, where did this child come from? Behind the curtains, that, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so, I, no, I, I, I think you're always, it, there's always going to be a sort of chasing after the event. It's, people aren't going to, you know, produce in a prepared way. You're assuming ghosts can be caught on Yeah. 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 Whereas you look at the the Raldiv experiments. I mean, I I just hear white noise, but people will always tell you, oh yeah, you can pick out these voices. You can pick. Oh, go back to Crom uh, Fleetwood Valley's um, Cromwell Valley's uh, spiritual telegraph. Yeah. You know, I, I think that those those experiences will continue to be odd, and will continue to, and and will get dressed up with. I mean, you'll hear all sorts of scientific, and I use scientific rather than scientific um, arguments for why you can't see anything accurately. I mean, I see postmodern science um, because I, I because eye movements are saccadic, and this is how you take in uh, images. It, it by this kind of constant movement of I've seen the argument that therefore you aren't ever seeing anything directly um, therefore it's con you know it's, it's in constant motion I, I'm, I don't have a problem with that but it, that as an argument seems bizarre to me to go beyond that um, well, actually so I'm a first born as well so I Paul, Paul, you did uh, mention that you, um, after your father died, that you had this very vivid mm. dream and him saying something to you. And my mother reported something similar when, when her mother died. And uh, she said, oh, you know, my mother, her gra her, my grandmother, um, appeared, to, appeared to me, you know, and, and said something comforting like everything's going to be all right or something yeah. like that. And I said, well, how did she appear to you? She said, well, in a dream. I said, well, of course, it's just a dream, you know. <laughs> but so I was quite, su quite surprised when you, you reported something. So is this not a kind of well-known phenomenon that people, um, you know, when, when loved ones died, there's quite a um, prevalence of these kind of dream appearances? Yes, yes. Um, and, and again, I think it's 
you know, it, it, the interpretation yeah. will depend on something quite independent mm. of, of the of the dream. Mm. Um, I, I mean, some of them were. <laughs> some of the ones I heard were. I mean, not not dreams even, but things like looking for um, uh, looking for some papers after a loved one had died, and not being able to find them. And somebody's saying, somebody's just shouting out, "Where are they?" At which point, it's sort of, oh, they're here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And interpreting this as, although one guy did say he he'd been driving down the motorway and had heard his deceased mother say to him. Why don't you marry this girlfriend? Um, which he then did. Happily, it turned out. But uh, so I, I, I think it's kind of the, the range of interpretation, <coughs> well, the, the range of phenomena and psychic, pheno uh, psychical. Yeah, yeah, psychic probably is the right word. Actually, um, is 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 huge. Uh, that can be assimilated and understood in, the, in these terms. My mother did say she was going to visit me after she died and I'm right. still waiting. <laughs> she died in <laughs> nearly I mean, ten years ago. Your mum used to talk about the, the kind of mess of her little white feather coming down. <laughs> and she kind of primed me to that. <laughs> I remember once walking out of the room. <laughs> Not long after she died. I mean, not the seagulls, like. And, this, oh. and of course, I mean, I was kind of trying to think of that, but yeah. you know, because it's just a, my friend, you know. I mean, yeah. I, but you, I remember the funny things she said. Yeah, yeah. My yeah. my mother was also, was a nurse, um, as indeed had her mother been, and her mother um, started to talk quite late on in her life about having seen a small boy over her shoulder uh, which my mother it, it kind of it took a it took a long time to, for anyone to kind of notice this and sort of what was going on uh, until some some scans and my grandmother had had a minor stroke um, at which my mother said oh well that explains the small boy you know so uh, there, there, there are registers um, it also may not deter you from enjoying the story as I, I think that's actually very nice as a as a story because it, it does get all of the the negotiations and all of the different kinds of savoring of narrative Many, many years ago, there was a house in Winton, and this lady, Annie, she had ornaments flying around the house. And I actually believed something weird like that, because she actually called the police. It must have been really scary. I've never heard anything ever since before, or ever since then, about, you know, spiritual things. So yeah. I, think, I think anything's possible. I think you should keep it in mind, don't you? Well, this, yeah, I mean, that there is this question of what is known scientifically or more to the point what is not known and you know science is is what is known thus far uh, and is in constant investigation of what else can can be known and that's a, you know that's <laughs> that's also an important thing for scientists not I mean and, and this is why I kind of made that point about meme theory it, it not to try and not for scientists not to try and look for shortcuts to explain away. I, I, I mean, just going back to that thing about um, what you know, what has a silly scientific arguments. I, I've seen the suggestion that culture is what humans develop to make up for what they haven't evolved which is nonsense frankly um, because all culture would then be the same and if it isn't then this is a predicate this is predicated on the idea that you are superior in some way intellectually to other people's culture um, rather than trying to understand that culture you know they, they sort of Evolutionary disadvantage in terms of culture either works across the board or it doesn't work at all. 
which is, is one of the criticisms that scientists and folklorists alike have made of meme theory. Um, it was it Lewis Wolpert said about, about meme theory, well, I don't really understand this. You know, what, what's a meme and what isn't? So is the first law of thermodynamics not a meme, but believing in God is? Um, So that's not his example. The first law of thermodynamics is his example, but I can't remember what the, the, the non-scientific one is. Um, but it's you have to, you know, you have to apply the same. You, you have to measure what is being measured, um, and folklorists, well, as I say, one stories don't tell themselves. Um, and I've seen some Susan Greenwood, or, or at least somebody who was writing blurb for her, um, making this point that oh, this, these folk tales have sort of lurked um, successfully in libraries <laughs> for centuries. No, people they don't lurk successfully in libraries. People find them in books, and people want to tell them. That's a different phenomenon. Um, and, and folklorists looking at motifs and tail types and kind of indexing and cataloging. And we have a, a kind of a deservedly bad reputation for being anal catalogers, um, often to the point of not, in, in the early period of folklore, of not analyzing what we were cataloging adequately. Um, but it is successful to the extent that, you know, we're able to say, no, look, we have got this form, you know, we have got this model of what we're actually looking at with, with whatever its problems um, that is systematic and is not just a, I don't, I don't like this one, so I'm going to have this as a meme, but that's a, you know, that's an arguable story. So, yeah, it, I mean, I, I think it does, it does really hinge on what people have said, what people have thought already, and how that is taken on by other people. Because that's, I mean, you know, folklorists, we're looking at transmission of tradition as much as the tradition itself. There seem to be something sexual going on in some of those pictures of damsels sort of you know um <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> making themselves available in some way. there was a there was a book um with a cover like that in particular i wondered what was going on there yes that that, that one in particular. oh well that's that's um that's fusely um that's uh carla is it the nightmare yes yes um and he did he did loads and loads of these um and yeah, and it's, it's quite often used, uh, I mean, it's kind of great early 19th century romanticism. Yeah. Um, wonderful, wonderful pictures, mm. actually. Mm. Uh, and, and they're quite often used to, il to illustrate uh, uh, sleep paralysis narratives. I think, from what I can remember, David Hufford used the same one, mm. or a, a version of the same one on his book. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yes. that, yeah. Um, That's it. Yeah, uh, and and they vary. I mean, Fusilli's pictures vary because in some of them you see more or less of the. Im you can't see this because it's sort of it's pixelated. But that's oh, that's right. a horse. Mm -hmm. That's that's the really weird one. Is that there's mm -hmm. a horse's head behind the, one of the curtains, um, which would presumably be the nightmare. Uh, mm. <laughs> Although there's this kind of the etymological distinctions between mare and Mara and, and, and kind of long histories of that. But uh, it is a really good book. Uh, interestingly, I think this is, this is his best work on this subject because this is the one that's most restrained and most within the structures of what is scientifically known. The further he gets on with, and there, there are subsequent articles um, on traditions of disbelief, where he becomes more explicit about um, mm. 
an interpretation or a, a, a reading of angelic or divine entities um, outside of culture and, uh, and that was the that was why I wanted to make that point that the experiences may be phenomenologically real they, you know, they may be scientifically observable um, and outside culture but their interpretations <coughs> never are uh, so, so I think you, you know, there's a certain going head to head with culture uh, whether you agree or disagree with what's being argued and that's fine but I think people have to be kind of just realistic about that's the, that's the dynamic that's the process that's going on well Paul I think we ought to start uh, wrapping up but um, thank you it's been uh, really fascinating insight into the research that you've done and uh, um, thank you for Mm. Yeah, sharing so much with us this evening. Yeah, as, as I say, if anybody does want, um, ten years old now, but um, so an article that I wrote on ghosts and their relationship with the age of a city, and it's it's really about sort of ghosts and historical interpretations. Please just give us a shout. But thank you so much. Please everybody. give Paul another big round of applause. Thank you.